Hey guys, it's C.S. Joseph with csjoseph.life doing another episode uh, for season 17. This is episode 10, uh, which is the virtue and vice of the quadras. Uh, so this is a Patreon live lecture and uh, where we have uh, patrons from gold tier and above join us directly as a live studio audience uh, within uh, this particular lecture. And I do apologize for the visuals uh, because apparently my camera decided to update itself and uh, well, that, that just basically absolutely sucks uh, because I've lost all of my settings and uh, I'm going to have to get that fixed. Uh, luckily, the chalkboard is almost done. It just needs at least maybe one or two more coats of paint on it and then I can get it hung and uh, then we will have a more traditional uh, setup for lectures moving forward. I'm gonna try to maybe use the green screen for more live stream uh, approach uh, and then uh, use uh, uh, use my uh, iPhone and the chalkboard uh, for just the, the more lecture approach. And that's just kind of the direction we're going. A uh, couple of updates uh, real quick. Uh, shouldn't be too long. But uh, the team and I have finalized our uh, written portion of the test. I'll be sharing pieces of it with you folks tonight as part of this lecture uh, for the written test. And uh, we finally have all of the video content completely outlined. And I may have all of that video content filmed uh, before the end of this weekend, uh, for which we'll be providing uh, to the audience, uh, to patrons at least to start, to test it out, see how they like it. And then we'll be launching it uh, to the world after the fact uh, for our personality test. I am very confident um, in its uh, ability. I maintain it is a 100% accurate test uh, or assessment, I guess, as it should be called. Uh, and the problem is, is that when human error is, you know, involving with these involved the assessment, it can give inaccurate results because of human error, because of improper human inputs. But what we've done is we've designed the test so that it actually teaches you how to take it accurately to ensure an accurate answer. And the best part is you don't actually have to start with the first question. You could actually answer any question in any order. It doesn't matter. And you don't even have to answer all of the questions. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, there's, there's questions available to you. You can answer them, whichever ones you're comfortable with answering, and you can still get an accurate result based on that. And it's a, uh, taken an insane amount of effort to put this together for everybody. But I think once everyone understands how it works intrinsically, they'll start to see the value. And we really went out of our way to make sure uh, that it is very well written. Um, I think we've probably had three iterations now of going through the writing and rewriting it um, to like very gigantic paragraphs to just a couple of sentences in certain areas, just to make it, uh, as accessible as possible. And that's kind of the goal that we're doing with that. So trying to do the meaningful thing and not the expedient thing is uh, the direction that we've been uh, taking the assessment. So, but anyway, uh, no need to talk about that further. Uh, let's get right on into season 17, episode 10. So uh, let me bring up my, um, my, uh, my outline. And no, Lev, I'm not going to start uh, I'm not going to stop wearing black because I'm not an SE user and I'm not here to, you know, give you a, a visually stimulating experience. Uh, that's, I mean, that's your job. I mean, you're, you have SE critic, right? So the responsibility, the responsibility of being, you know, giving a visual uh, experience is technically more on you than it is me. So, oh wait, you already have at one point in time, <laughs> but that's another, uh, another point for later. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening, Mr. Love, and the rest of you as well. So, um, as you're all aware, the Quadra lectures were the most controversial lectures uh, I have uh, released to date. And let's actually do kind of this. This lecture is kind of a, a little bit of a post mortem of uh, those lectures because I remember uh, a lot of drama being created from it. But I'll be straight, you know, in terms of how dramatic the season, seven, season 17 has, season 17, if you look at it as a whole, it literally is uh, the most controversial uh, piece of work that I've done so far. The first lecture literally explains how God works, essentially. And then all of a sudden, 
uh, where all cognition comes from, and then we dive into each of the individual four sides of the mind, and then from there we look at uh, we look at the four quadras. And uh, I mean, we've been spending our times in fours land. Like humanity is literally divided in groups of four constantly. We have four communication styles, aka interaction styles. We have the four dispositions, aka the four temperaments. Same thing. Uh, we have the four sides of the mind. We have um, we now have the four quadras. There's so many different ways to interpret the psyche of humanity as we know it that because of how different mankind is and how different uh, these, um, uh, you know, uh, but there's like, we know how different it is, but we also know the similarities. And it's nice to have a, a map to be able to figure out, okay, where is everyone, you know, at, at that point. And, and, and going further, I mean, uh, within season 19, we've been able to dive in deeper, uh, figure out uh, just how far mankind can go with integrating all of these different things, the communication style, the disposition, their quadra, uh, cognitive axis, uh, cognitive transition, and become the best possible self for yourself as a human being to be able to go even further, right? So we have we have that opportunity, and that's just something uh, that's been, you know, quite frankly, really fantastic for us uh, to be able uh, to be able to accomplish. And I'm I'm very proud, uh, you know, to to be a part of this and to be able to you know come up with the necessary frameworks to be able to you know guide humanity in that direction. And you know, because I'm in this position, I have to take responsibility for my own actions and uh, my own uh, my own faults because I can't just identify strengths of people's psyches. You know, this is why you have people out there where INFJs or INFP or INFPs, one of the two, uh, start complaining about being treated like these, you know, flighty super mega unicorns on the internet uh, without any actual substance. This is where we have people who criticize Frank James uh, uh, because he's actually an INFP when he claims to be an INFJ, which is creating a ton of confusion. Speaking of that confusion, uh, I was actually contacted by someone who's a moderator or an administrator of the official INFJ group on Facebook recently, and he informed me that he basically cut out that uh, that part where I'm psychoanalyzing Frank James uh, in in one of our um, um, how to type uh, uh, live streams. He created his own video, just basically as a cutout, and posted it on his YouTube channel. And then he posted it to every INFJ group uh, on in, on Facebook, and this uh, that he had access to. And this created a huge uproar. It created a lot of drama. And uh, because of that drama, people started to realize, oh, maybe I am actually an INFP, or oh, maybe I actually am an INFJ. And a lot of people's eyes were opened as a result of this. You know. It, it's important for us to become divisive, actually, not necessarily just constantly uniting all the time, because if we, if we focus on uniting, we're, may, we're at risk of never actually getting anything done, and it can actually create an echo chamber, or it can create a culture of um, uh, you know, mass cultural hypnosis or uh, a culture of ignorance because we're not actually challenging anything uh, and we're not actually changing anything because we don't have anything uh, to challenge with. Everyone has the same thinking and because of the lack of original thinking, it can cause a problem. So uh, when, it comes, when it comes to these things, it's necessary for me to be like, hey, here's all your weaknesses. Here is all of your flaws exposed, you know, at least, at least from the point of view of Quadra because it's one thing for me to release a lecture about an individual type. We all have seen, uh, we've all seen season three, for example, where in season three, I list the positives and negatives of each type. And so many people have so many emotional reactions, especially uh, INTJs and INFPs and INFJs, or at least people who think they're INFJs when they're not INFJs or ENFPs, uh, et cetera, even ENFJs. Uh, a ton of people uh, constantly complain about you know my, my delivery uh, when it, and your delivery sucks when it comes to season three, and for me to expose everyone's flaws necessarily within the context of one lecture involving one type, then people just automatically assume my delivery sucks. Or they automatically assume that uh, I'm being biased or whatever. 
but they only take the time to watch the one lecture that pertains to them and then they make all these assumptions and draw these wrong conclusions. The thing is though, is that a lot of those strengths or a lot of those flaws that I put forth within season three's content itself uh, actually applies to more than just one person. And that's one of the reasons why season seven exists, which is the virtue and vice series, because uh, you can start to tell that while people have primary virtues and vices, they also have secondary ones and shared virtues and vices with the other types, right? But the quadra lectures, uh, according to season 17, goes even deeper. And that's where we have uh, the last four episodes, which would be, uh, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, and nine, uh, those, those episodes uh, talking about the, the, the individual quadras. You are actually put in a place where you get to identify or at least experience or see or perceive or judge uh, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of each of the individual uh, of the quadras, but then there is four types within those quadras that basically share your pain or share your experience. And it was really important to me at that point in time to go out of my way to actually really show people how you come off to other people, basically. And this is a really important. And a lot of people, they, they say that, oh, you know, uh, you know, oh, you're really hard on Wayfarers for one thing. I'm like, yeah, I was pretty hard on Wayfarers. Do I admit that I was harder on Wayfarers than the other types? Not really. I could actually argue I was probably hardest on philosophers or I was hardest on Templars. I mean, it, it just really depends the person's perspective. But, you know, if you look at it previously, it's kind of imbalanced given that I was giving a lot of praise to Wayfarers, but never really spent as much time, you know, you know, looking at their negatives. So it was important to really, really hammer that point home. Granted, you know, I, everyone's like, oh, you're so biased. And I'm like, no, I, I like all of the individual 16 types. It's not, it's not a, it's not a big deal. You know, it, it is what it is. Like I have to be, you know, neutral in some capacity here, you know, so I move forward and I provide those criticisms and I provide those, uh, you know, some strengths and weaknesses, et cetera, but it was primarily to focus on weaknesses, primarily to show flaws, to show people how they come off to other people in a negative way, because it's so much easier to hear when you are in a group of four types instead of just your own individual type, because it's like, oh, okay, I'm not actually alone here. I'm not the only person with these flaws. I'm not the only person with these problems. I'm not the only person that, you know, causes me to, you know, come off in a certain way, right? And this is fundamentally necessary. This is absolutely necessary for people to have that experience because humanity, while we have independent pragmatic types, it still largely is an interdependent race. No one person can make it on their own, positively or negatively. Uh, because uh, when it comes to good and evil, we have to understand both sides fundamentally as a group, as well as externally and internally. You know, a lot of people can't see past their own nose. A lot of people do not really understand like how they come off to other people. And that's, that's a big problem. Uh, so here I come with the four uh, uh, quadra lectures to go and expose all of that. And then all of a sudden, everyone's whining and screaming and complaining about that. Let me tell you something, folks. If there really is an end of days and there is an actual judgment and all of humanity is standing before the seat of judgment and all of the books are opened up and literally everything anyone has ever done wrong ever is exposed to all of humanity, don't you think it would feel a little bit similar to what happened with the last four quadra lectures? Think about that for a second. Think about that. I venture to guess that humanity needs to get to a point where it's better that they should be honest with themselves and honest with each other and understand how they come off to other people and not necessarily how they come off to their own selves. Because at that point, it reaches a high level understanding within themselves because you can't love your fellow human beings unless you love yourself first. Well, you can't love yourself first until you understand. Self-understanding is a requirement for self-love. How are you going to love yourself? How are you going to take care of yourself? How are you going to forgive yourself, right? Think about it. You know, someone, you know, an INTP or an INFP who's been treated for so long for being like super mega weird, you know, comes to realize, no, they're actually not weird. This is how, you know, 
God intended them to behave, et cetera, and the rest of society is actually wrong. And then they could stop being depressed and then, and then they finally give themselves permission to be their own person, okay? Oh wait, I would imagine that would be a similar experience that any one of the 16 types would have, regardless of your rarity, regardless if you're a psychological minority. Because everybody has those struggles. Take an ISTP, they're the most stubborn of all the types, right? They're insanely stubborn. But then they understand why they're stubborn. And then as a result of that, they can actually understand themselves and love themselves and forgive themselves. And then maybe they could stop being so depressed all the time, so melancholy all the time with their vice. Do you guys see what I'm saying here? So in order for humanity to actually embrace virtue, you have to literally understand at a deep fundamental the specific vices that we all have. And the quadras are no exception. This is why this episode is called Virtue and Vice of the Quadras, because people need to understand that they have shared virtues and shared vices with at least four other types. And these types have these same struggles and benefits and uh, successes and failures uh, that the other ones do within their quadra. So this is how we're tying all this together. It, re it really comes down to this, guys. It really comes down to this. It comes down to what is meaningful versus what is expedient. What is a blessing or what is a curse? What's the difference between a curse and a blessing? Now, for all you interest-based people out there, I mean, this kind of would be like directly, you know, it directly speaks to you because if you are, um, you know, if you're cursed, that means like, like, let's say, let's say your relationship is cursed. You know, you have a relationship with your boyfriend and uh, your relationship with your boyfriend is cursed because he is getting way more out of it than you are. A curse is when you put a lot of effort into something and you get less in return than you put into it. That's a curse. A blessing is when you put effort into something and you get more return on investment than what you put in. That's a blessing. That's the difference. And that's literally how the quadras work. I spend so much time in the last four lectures talking about the curses and not as much talking about the blessing. So the reason why is because in order for one person to, you know, really reach their highest self, they have to fundamentally know how far the human condition can go. They have to know how far they're willing to be expedient about things. They, know have, to, they have to know how far they, they can uh, make that Faustian deal or get into the meaninglessness of life, basically, uh, or how they can screw over their fellow human beings. And each, and each of the four quadras are definitely there. Um, so, so based on that, it's, it's, it's really nice. It's really important to do this. So I'm doing my duty. So because my duty was the negativity of the last four lectures uh, were used to shed light on the darkness that we hold in as human beings and few are willing to accept. And this really cuts the men from the boys. It's just like what Jesus said, I haven't come to unite. I've come to bring a sword. I've come to divide father from son and mother from daughter because through division brings understanding through division brings um, no wisdom. This is why, you know, I'm fundamentally against cultures being, uh, you know, disrespected or being removed from this world. This is why I don't subscribe to the Martin Luther King doctrine, but I do subscribe to the Malcolm X doctrine because of the, nece the how necessary it is to preserve culture. Here's an example, and uh, here's examples of why this is important. And let, let's be fair. I've been pretty, you know, typically anti-SJ as an N-type would be, or, or an NTP would be against like an SFJ. Let's be honest. Let's assume that, you know, I've been very anti-SJ, SJ temperament, SJ disposition this entire time. And I've been very anti-tradition, especially with how pragmatic I am and, uh, you know, not so, uh, not so affiliative. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, you know, that mindset, let's just assume that, I'm super mega anti-SJ, super mega anti-tradition. Let me tell you something. There are some traditions that are absolutely necessary. Not all traditions should be removed. For example, what about food tradition? Because if you look at the United States of America, the fattest, the most inflamed, the most cancerous, the most sugared up of all of the rest of the world in terms of their diet and how unhealthy they are, as a, as, as a nation, 
uh, they have less food tradition. It's because all the food traditions have been combined and then sacrificed on an altar to, you know, uh, to basically, I guess you could say capitalism in some capacity, but that's not necessarily true because you could argue cap communism did a lot of the same issues as well. But the, but the bottom line is, is that because uh, you know of the economic system, because of the melting pots of culture, all those cultures are being melted, then it's creating a culture of sameness ultimately over time, where everyone is eating the same thing. All the natural food traditions of the past are being lost. You know what mother would be cooking in the kitchen no longer matters anymore because we could just go to McDonald's instead. And you know what if what if you're from the south? What if you're from the north? What if you're eating foods that are incompatible with your DNA? And all of a sudden you start to have DNA degradation, and then as a result, your genetic expression uh, in your health is is way worse off than it could be potentially. All as a result of loss of tradition. See, so guys, tradition is absolutely necessary, but at the same time, like some. Uh, you know, some traditions obviously should be rejected. I mean, this is why SPs exist because SPs test tradition to make sure that they have integrity as to whether or not they should be allowed to exist, right? When it comes to the quadras, the quadras have their own way of doing things. The quadras uh, have their own, uh, you could say, traditions of behavior. You know, it, it's not necessarily, you know, SJ is that temperament, but from the quadras themselves, they have their own, uh, their own approach to life. They understand what is meaningful. They understand what is expedient. But what quadras don't necessarily understand, they may understand how they come off to each other, but then they don't understand how they come off to others. You see what I'm saying? Like, if you really want to grow and be like a better person, ask someone who's very similar to you for criticism, and you'd be like, oh, wow, I didn't realize I came off that way. Kind of like an ENTP going up to an ISFJ asking for advice. Like that's a very painful thing. Or, or imagine, you know, having an ENFJ parent when you yourself are, is an STP and then asking them for advice. That's pretty rough. Or asking them for help. That's pretty rough. It gives you a nice window into your own soul, right? And then maybe those personal behavior patterns, those personal traditions don't necessarily matter anymore because it's like, wait a minute, I'm actually uh, confronted with the enemy and the enemy is me, right? This is why it's so important to talk about the pain, negativity, and all the flaws that people had. It's so important to talk about the vices of the four quadras because then we get to have a fundamental understanding of the human condition, aka sin nature, for our race. How can our race actually change and reach higher heights of cognition, of, of, um, of uh, social behavior, of what the NFs call their little ideal utopian world. How is that even possible if we can't even get past our own noses? And if we can't see past our own noses, if we can't be the art, like these people and understand exactly where our flaws are coming from. How many of you were humbled when you found out that you have sacrificed your fellow human beings for your personal gain? How many of you were humbled when you found out that you had a tendency to steal things instead of earn them? Or what about, uh, what about those of you who thought that you were fighting in the name of justice when you actually became the avatar of injustice itself? Or what about when you realized that you were hypocrites criticizing other people for being unrighteous when realizing that you yourself weren't at the same time? How many, how many times have we been confronted with these issues? So that's where the, thank you, Judy. That's where the virtues and the vices, you know, for the quadras stem from. And it's because this is our latent natural behavior. This is natural to us as human beings. But again, you know, oftentimes we're going in our life and looking at other people and we're completely ignorant of the fact of how we come off to others and how these vices of ours are just literally hanging out there and we don't even know. You know, don't you think it's more useful to criticize someone and tell them the truth about how they're behaving and who they really are so that they can maybe, you know, check themselves and then give them an opportunity to identify areas of personal growth so that they can be a better person? You know, I, I'd imagine that that would be like important. I, I'd really imagine that. So anyway, let's, uh, let's, share the, um, let's share the whiteboard here just for a little bit. 
So here's the whiteboard. Uh, so let's go through it. Um, the virtue and vice of the quadras uh, and also uh, the quadra, uh, meaningful and the expedient according to the quadras. Remember where we get meaningful versus expedient. Meaningful versus expedient comes from chapter seven of 12 Rules for Life of Jordan Peterson, uh, a book that I share with people and I'm often criticized uh, by my own friends for supporting even though I'm not a fan of Jordan Peterson at all, but at least his book, 12 Rose for Life, is a fantastic book in of its own right. Apparently, I can't uh, recommend uh, a book written by a person that I don't like. Apparently, I can't do that, uh, but whatever. It is what it is. Uh, that being said, uh, here are the four quadras, Crusaders, Templars, Philosophers, Wayfarers, and their associated types. Crusader has ESFJ, ISFJ, ENTP, INTP. Templar has ESTP, ISTP, ENFJ, INFJ. Philosopher has ESTJ, ISTJ, ENFP, INFP. And Wayfair has ESFP, ISFP, ENTJ, INTJ. Now, if you'll notice, it's kind of a little out of order. It's because this is going clockwise starting at Crusader. This is a clockwise grid here. And I'm audibly saying these things for those listening on the podcast. I realize that it's really redundant and I apologize in advance, but it is for their benefit, not just those of us who are visually watching. If you want to learn more about the podcast, go to csjoseph.live forward slash podcast to get on the podcast. But here are the virtue and vices. So for the crusader, we have uh, the virtue of justice and the vice of injustice. Uh, and then for the Templar, we have the virtue of righteousness versus unrighteousness or, or hypocrisy. And then the, uh, for the Wayfair, we have the uh, virtue of earning one's own way uh, versus the vice of stealing one's own way. And then the philosopher, uh, virtue of self-sacrifice versus uh, sacrificing other human beings for your own personal gain, aka human sacrifice. Uh, these are the virtue and vices of the Quadras. Now, before we get into talking about specific examples of those, this is now the point in time with the lecture where I'm going to be talking about and discussing, you know, some of the definitions. So I'm going to, before I go into a little bit more of the virtue and vice, let's talk about the definition one more time as a, uh, as a um, uh, you know, as a refresher for the specific quadra. So for Crusader, um, I, I have written here the way of the Crusader. So let, let's begin. And this comes directly from our personality assessment. Crusaders are dutiful champions of fairness and protecting the innocent. They place their faith in truth and seek to bring about a just world. Crusaders seek to make, happy, uh, make others happy, yet have difficulty accepting happiness uh, for themselves. Through adversity, they obtain happiness. Crusaders see hardship as something to persevere through and wield high endurance, but are at risk of bitterness or being too cold when dealing out justice. Crusaders are at risk of hypocrisy by finding the innocent guilty and can become a source of injustice. So that's an interesting definition. So uh, what does that mean? That means, you know, while because crusaders are so focused on fairness they have the risk they, they they everything is all about justice everything has to be fair and just and actually just recently i had a uh, a family member uh who uh who was giving was giving money uh to their children basically and then her husband got all upset is like why are you giving so much money to your children etc and then uh his wife is like well i mean you gave money to your children. You give money to your children all the time. Why can't I give money to my children? Because they're like a, a mixed family. Um, you know, she had children uh, before being married to him. He had children before being married to her. And they have two different sets of children, right? And he's complaining about her giving money to her children when the reality situation is, is that he's already been giving money consistently, their money consistently to, to his children. And she's like, hello, have you forgotten? It's, you know, it's pretty fair. Funnily enough, she's an ISFJ, he's an ESFP. Funny, funny how that works. The ESFP is forgetting how many times he's already given money to his children. And she, with her SI, has to remind the ESFP, hey, you give, children, you give money to your children all the time. Why can't I give children to my money? See, that's fair. That's just, et cetera. And this is why crusaders are so focused. It's just an example. 
uh, they're so focused on justice, on fairness, because without fairness, you know, <laughs> that they don't really want to live in a world that's not fair, that, or at least they want to bring fairness to the world, I guess is a better way of saying it. Let me, let me tell you crusaders something. The only fair thing about life is that life is not fair. And life being unfair is actually a huge gift. It is a huge gift because it is written an eye for an eye, right? Well, guess what? The old adage goes, an eye for an eye turns the whole world blind, right? Uh, so if life really was fair, if it really, really was fair, justice would be so blind that everybody would be lacking an eye. If you know what I'm saying? The whole world would be blind at that point. So justice is not always the end all be all. And this is why we call it, you know, the cold, uh, the cold source, the cold sword of truth, the icy sword of truth, because justice ultimately is heartless. There is no heart behind the justice that a crusader would meet out upon another person. It just, you know, that's it. Whack final judgment done, moved on, you're guilty, and I am punishing you, moving on to the next thing. And this is why I've criticized uh, crusader types in the past, especially ISFJs, for being willing to sell out their own children for the sake of what they perceive or what they believe is fair or just, right? Especially, you know, when they, when they mix that in with their religion and it's like, well, I'm affiliative and my religion gives me the authority to treat my children that way, right? Okay, that's, that's, that's not appropriate. But this is just one example of the many examples that fairness could be there. Here's another example of fairness. Why do I have to work harder than that person, right? Or, or, um, or how is it that person's getting a promotion? I've been here for 15 years, right? There's the fairness is such a big deal to to uh, to crusader types and and justice and they are loyal to people that allow justice to exist and without justice well then they're not loyal to that person anymore. The problem is is that crusaders because of the potential ignorance of TI and remember what the ignorance of TI is because crusaders they're all about uh, they're all about truth right they're their TIFE right. And because they're so focused on logic, right? You know, this is where truth and faith mixes together. That's where how we get a crusader, uh, logic and faith, uh, because the faith of SI, the truth of the logic of TI comes together to create a, a crusader. Um, when this happens, uh, you know, they end up in this, they, they're, they, if their TI is ignorant of their situation, if they're ignorant of the circumstances involving a particular situation, they will pass judgment on somebody based on their own ignorant thinking. And while they believe they're on the side of justice, they're actually on the side of injustice. And then as a result of that, they are passing judgment on the innocent, assuming that the innocent are guilty when they're not they're actually innocent imagine the amount of guilt that would come upon a crusader who does that but crusaders believe it or not do this all the time this is the crusader vice this happens all the time right why why does it happen it happens because the ignorance of ti itself remember what the ignorance of ti is and that is making decisions based on last known input or making decisions based on uh, preferred input, AKA personal bias. It's when they're being biased. Um, and uh, because they're making decisions, you know, it's like, okay, well, I prefer the, to hear what the pulpit says at church. I prefer to adhere to church doctrine or church discipline. I remember going to Marshall Church in Seattle, Washington. And I remember people being put on church discipline. And I remember how stupid that was. And it's funny because Pastor Mark Driscoll was an ESFJ. Okay, I guess that makes sense because there's a such thing as church discipline. Thank you, Mark Driscoll. I mean, it's because of uh, BS systems like that that he had within his church. No wonder they turned upon him and exposed him for being a plagiarist and then throwing him out uh, such that now he has a new church called Trinity in another state while his mega church, Mars Hill, went down in flames specifically because of that unfair injustice behavior, that injustice vice, right? Church discipline? Are you kidding me? Wow. As if the church can actually put any authority over man. I Last I thought, God was the authority, not man. 
oh, but then let's just, you know, listen to the, you know, BS verses of Paul that, you know, uh, what, what authorities exist, God put them in their power. Okay, yeah, well, that's a direct contradiction to what Jesus said to Pon Pontius Pilate, where he's like, what power uh, has been given to you comes from above, but the person who delivered me into your hands is guilty of greater sin. Wow. Okay, direct contradiction. Thank you, uh, Apostle Paul, for yet another contradiction. I really appreciate that. This is why I completely reject your teaching. Just guidelines, just words of wisdom at that point. Yeah, I'm very critical of the Bible, folks. There's a reason for that. Probably because it's unjust and I'm a crusader. Think about that for a second. You see what I'm saying? Like, and of course, you know, but guess what? Every single uh, belief system on the planet, uh, when it gets to this authoritarian affiliative point of view, when it reaches critical mass, such as Christianity or Islam or whatever belief system there is, they all have a tendency to have that cultish uh, behavior where they have to enforce their own rules upon other people against their will, which is not, which is actually undermines their fundamental foundation as a belief system to begin with. That's illogical. Think about that for a second. Anyway, so that's what happens. Crusaders end up, because they, because they become ignorant, in their ignorance, they create injustice. If a crusader is being wise and not foolish and not ignorant and actually verifying all their beliefs and verifying the circumstances, then they will take up the side of justice. How many crusaders around the world would not suffer the existence of society in its current form if they actually spent the time to verify their actual beliefs about their own culture, community, politics, their governments, their church, their family? How many of them would actually be willing to rise up and take arms if they actually spent the time to verify their own beliefs and they did it collectively together? And created a new affiliative, a new authoritative, a new authority. I wonder what would happen. Hmm? Hmm? Maybe it's starting to make sense uh, as to why Philip Pullman actually wrote the books that he did, the books about the golden compass and the subtle knife and the amber spyglass. Very interesting, very, very interesting story, especially, spoiler alert, Lord Asriel at the very end, sacrificing a child to create a gateway into a new realm. That was crazy. But more on that in a minute. Templars. Moving on to Templars, so let's give a let's give another look of the um, of the um, whiteboard here. So Templars, uh, unrighteousness versus righteousness, or hypocrisy versus um, righteousness. Templars, uh, Templars are kind of interesting because in terms of awareness of consequences of actions, um, you know, SPs out of all the types, they're just unaware of the consequences of their actions because co awareness of consequences comes from expert intuition right? And while NFJs have a higher awareness of consequences of their actions, the STPs definitely do not. And this is, uh, but then at the same time, it's like, well, when you have, uh, when you have NI, your top four functions, then FE, it's like, okay, I have a choice between being, you know, uh, very people pleasing, but at least I could use that as a way to get what I want, you know? And then is that, does that really tend to lend someone to be responsible because they don't care so much about their personal reputation or their status in the eyes of other human beings? Not so much. As a result of this, you have Templar types who uh, end up having that Peter Pan syndrome that extend out, they fully on extend out their, um, um, their boyhood or their, their immaturity uh, and, uh, and they do not reach manhood or womanhood uh, until much, much later. This is why, you know, like, hey, let's just, uh, yeah, meaningless sex, guys. I, I don't know how many times I've heard of Templars having constant meaningless sex, the ESTP being the worst one with their nymphomania, because they're just trying to mirror the tragedy of the world. And it's like, well, everyone's doing it, so I'm going to do it too, right? But it's no different than the other Templars, because guess what? All the Templars are mirrors. And it's so funny because they can be actually become corrupt over time where their mirrors actually end up cracking the same way that you have, uh, as I tell INFJs, get the losers out of their life because INFJs are the most sensitive mirrors, which is why their virtue and vice is what it is in terms of integrity versus corruption because they are the ultimate mirror. But the other uh, three Templars share in that mirroring behavior and they could use that mirror even maliciously where it's like, oh, well, you did this th you did this thing, so that justifies me to do this bad thing over here. And it's like, okay, wow, that's really appropriate. Ultimately, this lends them down the road to hypocrisy because Templars can't help themselves. They cannot help themselves in criticizing other people because their expert in sensing can detect what other people are doing 
and their introverted thinking, TI, starts to criticize those other people on their lack of strength, their poor character, or their poor performance. Yet at the same time, the Templar themselves are lacking in character and are performing poorly themselves. You see what I'm saying? So as a result of that, they are hypocrites. They're expecting other people to have high character, but they themselves lack that character entirely. And they even start making excuses in their heads. They end up making excuses. Thank you, Judy. Uh, and those excuses basically become, you know, oh, well, I don't have to grow up right now. Uh, I don't have to, you know, become more responsible right now, as long as I'm not calling else anyone, I'm not calling out anyone else. This is why it's like, hey, you know, I can, I could snort some coke or I could shoot up anytime I want because it don't affect anybody else. It don't hurt anybody else. Well, that's the biggest lie I've ever heard. Yes, actually it does. Because guess what, Templars? It makes you a bigger burden on other people. Oh, wait a minute. That's like the ignorance of TI coming out for you. You being ignorant. Because it's like, oh, I have my preferred input uh, or my personal bias where I'm only going to surround myself with people who think and do like I do. And then I can keep having the excuse of, well, everyone else is doing it. Wow, that's, that's, that's really nice, Templars. That, that's really great. You know, I mean, at least, at least you're not finding the innocent guilty. At least you're not doing that. But then, hey, you know, you could use that excuse of, well, everyone else is doing it or I'm not hurting anybody else. You can use that excuse and then all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, oh, I wasn't aware that I become a burden on other people. Yeah, just like, you know, the INFJ making the excuse of not, uh, of, of failing to launch in their lives, you know, because it's like, well, if I take risks, I'm going to be doing the wrong thing or, you know, or I could be performing badly. I could potentially be creating harm when, uh, you know, everyone else is, uh, is not doing it. Why do, why do I have to, you know, people are allowed to stay at their parents' house, you know, but why do I have to, you know, uh, things like that, guys. It's just, it's just, it's just ridiculous to me. You know, the, the INFJ needs to come to realize that just because other families allow it, that doesn't need to be the standard for their own life. They need to be who they are for their own selves, right? It's the same thing with the other uh, four Templars. Templars need to get to a point that they need to be taking responsibility for their actions, not because they're caught, they, they, not because they allow themselves to take responsibility because other people are taking responsibility. If you notice that, it's always an excuse that they have. Templars, it's your job to lead other people. It's your job to be an example to other people. Other people's bad behavior is not an excuse for you to behave badly. You have to rise up and rise above yourself and be your own person, okay? Otherwise, this vice of unrighteousness, this hypocrisy that you have will literally consume you and you will be a burden on other people. Nobody will be loyal to you. Nobody will listen to you. Nobody will value you because to you or to them, you are worthless to them. So don't allow this to happen, Templars, because guess what? You're the strongest of us all. Your job is to create character and strength of being and other human beings. Have the ability to teach them. Have the ability to build them up. Have the ability to heal them. This is what you're supposed to do all the time, Templars. That means by default, you're strong and you're stronger than the rest of us. Why else do you have the fiery sword of truth compared to anybody else? Why else? The fiery sword of truth, it cuts you as it cuts them. Better you to be cut, though, than necessarily them because your fiery sword cauterizes their wounds and at least brings healing because when you tell the truth to others, it brings healing. You can't heal anybody, and your healing is ineffective if you're just going on your life, not willing to read or listen to other people because you Templars are super stubborn. I can't believe how stubborn you people are. You are so stubborn. It's ridiculous how stubborn Templar types are. And because of that stubbornness, you guys are unwilling to listen. And when you are unwilling to listen, you start to mirror other people's bad behavior and you do not allow yourself to improve, okay? And because you're not improving, then you are not allowing yourself to, 
you're not able to build up other people because here's another example. Templars always have this thing that when they have their circle of friends, they generally, especially ESTPs and INFJs, they got to be the top dog. They got to be the top dog, especially, especially ESTP and INFJ because Hey, you know, at least everyone else is weaker than them and they're really comfortable in that environment because they can help those people. The problem is they start mirroring weaker people, then they become weak themselves, which leads to hypocrisy. Templars, you have to have two groups of people, the weak people that you help and the strong people that are just better and more capable than you to learn from. What business do you have teaching others and developing others if you cannot develop and teach yourself? What business do you have? So as a result of that, isn't the righteous thing to do to actually understand that, hey, regardless of what anyone else is doing, I need to take responsibility for myself and my own actions and focus on my own personal continuous improvement, regardless of what other people are doing forever. Never use other people's behavior as an excuse for your poor behavior ever again. You are still responsible for you. It doesn't matter what other people are doing. I'm tired of you using the stupid excuse. I'm tired of it. Let go. Just because other people are doing it doesn't mean you get to. No, you're supposed to be an example so that other people can actually become good people. What happens when you see a philosopher who's sacrificing their fellow human beings? Why are they going to listen to you when you have the reputation of only caring about yourself? When you only have a reputation of, well, I'm only going to help you if I, if I see you and help others or, or if you've helped me in the past. Because it's all about what, well, it's all about me and what I can get. It's all about as long as I get mine, right? The, 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 the Templar way, right? But the righteousness, guys, that comes as a result of letting go of your ignorance. The ignorance of TI, the preferred input or personal bias versus last known input. If you're not relying on those things and focusing on verifying your behavior every single day and reading things, talking to other people, finding out what other people's value systems are, finding the good ones, which ones are based on truth and not bullshit tradition. And then as a result of that, you take on those value systems and then you're actually able to build up your character faster than everyone else. Then as a result of that, you're then able to confer that knowledge and wisdom upon others, that truth upon others and criticize others in such a way where you're able to provide them healing and build up character, strength of character within themselves. Folks, this is what happened to me. I was mentored by two Templars, an ESTP and an INFJ, especially in terms of this psychology, but the ESTP also mentored me in manhood. He also mentored me in women. He also mentored me in uh, uh, like, botany. He also uh, mentored me in uh, sword fighting and, and various other uh, areas. Uh, driving even. Uh, he, wow, he was very critical of my driving. And uh, I became a better driver and discovered the use of an e-brake in a situation. So um, based on that, like recognize that there is some huge benefits to be gained. I would not be here if an ESTP at least went out of their way uh, to be, uh, you know, to be righteous, right? Recognize the importance of that virtue and vice. So let's move forward. So for the philosopher type, the philosopher type is human sacrifice versus self-sacrifice. Um, actually, no, we're going to do Wayfair next, actually. Stealing versus earning. So Wayfarers. Wayfarers are fantastic. They're actually pretty brilliant, especially, like, I, I'm getting to know ESFPs, um, uh, getting to know ESFPs recently, uh, it's been it's been great because uh, I like how concrete they are. I like how they don't um, they're not usually aware of the consequence of their actions. And you know, in season nineteen, you get to learn more about like their struggle with causality and how they just stumble their way upon the truth, etc. Uh, which I find is a fascinating uh, a fascinating thing. But watching an ESFP with TI trickster like become one of the world's greatest uh, physicists is just absolutely amazing. And they earned their way. They didn't cheat, right? Especially in an academic situation, how many times do wayfarers cheat at school? Let's be honest, everybody cheats. Uh, I mean, I'll admit, I, even I cheated in school. I, I mean, I, let's be honest, I never actually read a book in school after my sophomore year in high school. Throughout my entire education, I never read a book after that, not once. I didn't need to, but everyone is taking the quick expedient way, especially when it comes to academics and cheating is a big thing. 
but how many times, you know, but Wayfarers, all the types, they seem to like do it a lot more, right? Because they're taking other people's work and then using it for their own. Yeah, plagiarism comes into play or, or various other forms of cut and corners, et cetera. This is a thing. But then there are those that actually earn it and are able to create something absolutely astonishing, uh, like this uh, ESFP uh, physicist that I know. It's unbelievable. He's a fantastic scientist. Or, uh, or, the, uh, or the INTJ uh, chemist who's able to develop uh, new, new forms of chemicals and processes uh, such that uh, mankind is able to reach a high level of health because of a particular pill that they invented uh, that solves a specific problem, or at least uh, provides a lot of relief for a specific problem so that other problems could be solved. It just ends up having this endless wheel of causality constantly going where they end up having where they end up generating a lot of positive consequences for them taking unknown actions, right? And this happens all the time. This is how ultimately wayfarers end up creating or discovering treasure, right? And treasure is absolutely important. Treasure, treasure is everything. But the problem is, is that wayfarers seeking treasure, they got to understand how treasure intrinsically works. See, let me tell you something. You can't take your money with you when you die. There's only one thing, one thing that you can take with you when you die. One. And that is, folks, the relationships you have with other human beings. That's the only thing you can take with you when you die. And if that's the case, maybe wayfarers should be investing, you know, investing their treasure into other human beings. Hmm. Maybe that would be important. I think through investing treasure, uh, they would find themselves in a situation uh, where you know people are like, "Oh wow, you're sharing with me, right? How many times do we have people like wayfarers not sharing with other people?" So that's uh, I think that's very very important. Uh, the lesson ultimately is is that when you're earning your own way, you begin to share. Sharing is a huge imp important aspect of the virtue of the wayfarer is sharing, you know, instead of taking, right, or stealing versus earning. Because if you're just stealing from people, that turns into negative relationships. And you don't want to be taking those negative relationships because they'll remember, they'll never forget what you stole from them. They will never forget. You don't want that to translate into the afterlife, let me tell you. Think about that for a second. And I'm just using the afterlife as an example here. But looking in just regular life as, as we know it, life as we know it, that's still a problem. And, you know, because I get that you're very NI focused, but let me tell you something, Wayfarers, about your future. If you steal from somebody, it will come back to haunt you. I guarantee it. Have you ever watched The Count of Monte Cristo? Like, there's some people out there, especially Crusaders, who are very vengeful. And they will be willing to wait decades before they have their opportunity to take a shot at you and land that killing blow that they've been planning for such a very long time. Don't believe me? It happens all the time. You have to understand is that you can do the quick way and take what other people have earned from them for yourself or, or not share what you have earned and keep it all for yourself. You can take the quick way or you can take the meaningful way uh, and then uh, be like, hey, you know, help other people earn their treasure. Share your treasure with other people. Earn it for yourself and for your own performance. But then stop expecting other people to praise you when you perform well every single time. You need to stop trading your performance for loyalty. Giving somebody treasure does not necessarily mean they're going to be loyal to you. Because here's the thing, you can buy loyalty. You can have an agreement saying, if I give you this treasure, you have to give me this in return. That's fine. But is that true loyalty? Is that really true loyalty? Because I would imagine that wayfarers would want true loyalty. See, that requires trust. Think about it this way. What's the best example that you could utilize to determine somebody's loyalty or trustworthiness for you as a wafer. Well, that's obvious. That's the parable of the talents. You ever hear of the parable of the talents? Basically, a landover takes all of his wealth, separates his wealth between three servants. He gives one servant a huge amount of money ten, and, and 10 parts. He gives 10 parts of it to uh, his one servant. He gives three parts to another servant, and he gives one part to uh, the third servant. 
And the one with the 10, uh, the 10 uh, parts, he goes off and he invests it and he makes a, generates a huge amount of wealth, wealth and, then, uh, and then is able to show the master, hey, this is what I produced with what you've given me. And then the second guy who had three parts, he did the same. I was able to make a major profit. Here's what it is. But the third guy, third guy didn't do anything with it. He just oh, dug a hole and put it in the ground. And then, uh, you know, that was it. And like the master got so upset. It's like, what did you do with all this thing that I just, all these things that I just gave you? You could have at least taken it to the bank and gotten some interest on it. You are so slothful. You are so lazy, you know, very selfish. How could you do this? Wayfarers, that's kind of the, the relationship that you need to have with people. When you're sharing your treasure with people, see what they do with it, right? That's how you can test their character. So test their character, test their loyalty based on how, what treasures you share with them and see if you can trust them. If you can trust them with it, if they demonstrate trustworthy behavior with your treasure, fantastic. Continue to have that relationship and invest, invest in that relationship, Wayfarers. But if you're not, if they're, if they're squandering what you give them, do not give them anything else and move on. Let them be in the ditch. Stop feeling bad for people that don't deserve the treasure that you actually earned. Unless, of course, you stole that treasure, then I guess it doesn't matter then because it's nothing, it's like literally the same as venture capitalism because at that point in time, it's like, ooh, we're just gonna borrow money and then because we borrowed money and it's someone else's money, we're gonna be irresponsible, more irresponsible that money instead of money that I earned myself. Isn't it kind of interesting, Wayfarers, how you're more likely to take the meaningful route instead of the expedient route? Because when you go out of your way to perform and earn things on your own, it means that much more to you. So you are not so willing to just trust that with just anybody. Have you ever figured that out? Kind of makes sense, does it? Don't steal. Earn it yourself. But then because you've earned it, you will care so much more about what treasure you do have and you give it to others because you know, and share it with others because you know you earned it. Stop stealing from other people. I've had people try to steal intellectual property from me all the time. Uh, I've, I've, watched, uh, I've watched Wayfarers uh, steal each other's uh, email lists from each other. I've, I've seen them, um, I mean, Frank Abagnale, he's a Wayfair. He uh, used the, uh, the check system to do fraudulent checks to give himself a fortune basically. And he was on the run for most of his life until he was caught uh, at the end of his uh, 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 young adulthood, basically, uh, where he served time in prison. And now he helps uh, catch other people who uh, are uh, check fraudsters, etc. Uh, you know, and, and he's a wayfarer, right? So, um, oh yeah, I did forget. I was just reminded. I did forget to make a certain point. Um, so I'm actually going to fix that uh, in a second here. Um, since we're talking about wayfarers, I would like to talk about the definition of wayfarers uh, because I forgot the definitions, guys, so I apologize. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so wayfarers are independent, realistic, and matter of fact. They challenge the status quo in favor of finding a better way. This is why they're so good at performing, guys, because any performance, that, that form of originality is absolutely, is fundamentally creative, right? They're very artistic. Why else is the ISFP, the artist, as, as some would call it, aka the Druid, uh, is part of the Wayfarers. There's a reason for that. So they challenge the status quo in favor of finding a better way. Wayfarers require freedom uh, to pursue their own interests and way of life. Wayfarers are all about being free. Wayfarers are the people that design their own way of life. And that way of life needs to be respected by other people. I don't think a society that's a theocracy or at least has heavily, heavy uh, religious influence, like especially societies that bind to Catholicism or societies that bind into Islam, et cetera, consistently as their main mode of thinking, as their main mode of moral thinking and ethical thinking, et cetera. I, I imagine that those societies would be very anti-wayfarer because it threatens the wayfarer's freedom or their capability to, to, to create their own way of life. I think, I think that'd be a problem. Wayfarers are self-assured and express, them th express themselves through personal performance, often competitively. Uh, not, not, not a bad thing. Competition sharpens their, their edge. It sharpens their ability to, uh, to perform. Not a bad thing. They seek admiration and loyalty 
but doubt others' ability to provide it. I mean, they should because not everybody is going to appreciate the treasure that the uh, Wayfarer shares with them. That makes a lot of sense. Um, their purpose is to pursue treasure and the status it brings, choosing with whom they share it. Uh, you know, that's another freedom point. Like Wayfarers need to be able to choose who they share. And that's why I'm telling you guys, you have to use your treasure to really measure the character of other people. Use the parable of the talents. Find a way to give treasure to other people and see what they do with it. How many times, Wayfarers, have you been, like, for example, in sexual relationships with other people, but they were disloyal to you because you gave those people your greatest treasure, you know, your body, for example, and then uh, your mind, for example, uh, everything about you, for example, and you give this treasure and it was been squandered, stomped upon, trampled upon. Isn't it also written, do not throw pearls before swine? Think about that for a little bit, Wayfarers. Think about that. Their purpose is to pursue, tr tr pursue treasure and the status it brings, choosing with whom they share it. Wayfarers are at risk of stealing treasure rather than earning it for themselves. I think that very well defines the virtue and vice uh, of uh, the Wayfarer Quadra just fine. Um, going, back, um, going back to the Templar real quick, I'm going to read their definition before moving on to philosopher because we kind of lost out on that. So uh, the way of the Templar... Templars seek people of character or build character in those who lack it. They are interested in strengthening the well-being and character of others. Templars require uh, freedom to make their own choices and find their own way in life. Uh, they teach, mentor, and counsel. They forgive and help people heal. Ghosting traitors or people who refuse to take responsibility for themselves. Templars are at risk of hypocrisy when criticizing others for being irresponsible while being irresponsible themselves. I think that pretty much defines the virtue and vice pretty well of Templars. Um, and then finally, we have the philosopher. So, and the philosopher, as uh, we found out in the last lecture of season uh, 17, and this is the final section of this lecture right now, uh, we have for ourselves, I think we're probably in about, uh, um, so um, I think uh, so. I think we've been in this for about an hour now. But uh, the final section is this. Uh, so the the way of the philosopher, the definition of the philosopher is uh, as follows: um, Philosophers are academically inclined to discover secrets to success. You ever been to a? Ever heard of Tony Robbins? I mean, that guy's a philosopher. Let's be honest. They craft a worldview to share belief, ideology and reputation. Philosophers are drawn to civic duty, volunteering, and politics to strengthen their voice through enduring hardships, or to strengthen their voice. That's why they do that. It's so funny. When you're talking to a philosopher, everything is about their opinion. Everything is about their voice. Uh, and they want, uh, they really have that need to have their voice and their opinion desired because they don't feel important themselves if other people do not desire their voice, do not desire their opinion. That's why whenever I'm around a philosopher, whether or not I want to hear it or not, I ask them automatically, hey, what's your opinion? Then all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, that's super valuable because it's like, hmm, maybe I should just get over myself and actually spend time to listen to them so that way my TI parent is within its own little echo chamber causing me to be ignorant. I need to hear other input or other opinions, right? To be able to make sure that my TI is sharp enough to not be in some echo chamber or I'm relying upon last known input, right? Same thing goes with Wayfarers. I go to Wayfarers and treat them the same way. I ask them their opinion. But the value of one's opinion is so much more to a philosopher. It's absolutely more. So that gentleman, Mr. Kelsey, uh, when you, uh, the one who uh, met me at a Panera Bread in uh, Fremont, California, uh, on, uh, on Maori uh, in Fremont, California, uh, this part of the lecture goes to you, sir, because uh, without you expressing your concerns about my description of INFPs, uh, I would not have been able to come to the correct conclusions. Thank you very much for your input. So... Philosophers, uh, through enduring hardships, philosophers establish rules and guidelines they believe are righteous. Yeah, and sometimes they're like arbitrary. That's like a thing where they create random arbitrary rules and expect other people to follow them, which can be an issue. Uh, but sometimes it can also be very healthy and necessary. 
Uh, they attend to their own happiness and comfort, yet can be inattentive to that of others. And that's oftentimes why philosophers end up having the reputation and status of being selfish and self-absorbed and all about their personal gains, such that they're being willing to sacrifice their fellow human beings for the sake of their own self-aggrandizement. And that's why I also like grandstanding because it's all about their voice and no one else's voice. <coughs> Philosophers are at risk of sacrificing fellow human beings for the sake of their own success instead of success gained through self-sacrifice and hard work. So this defines the virtue and vice of the philosopher type. And, uh, and that's really human sacrifice or self-sacrifice. This is why I utilize the, uh, the example of the philosopher stone or the model of the philosopher stone uh, for, uh, you know, from, uh, from Full Metal Alchemist, as well as the legend of, of alchemy involving the philosopher stone. And again, real quick, the philosopher stone basically is this thing that you utilize that you could create, uh, it, gives you, it gives you the ability to reach eternal life and an elixir for eternal life and allows you to, to change any substance into gold, basically. So you have unlimited wealth. It's literally life's I win button. And every philosopher is on a quest to create their own philosopher's stone so that they can have the success that they always desire within their own life. That is a way of the philosopher creation of their philosopher's stone. And they could do this as, according to Full Metal Alchemist, sacrifice fellow human beings in creating that philosopher's stone, or they could do it through self sacrifice, which is what the hero of the story, Edward Elric, did. He sacrificed his own ability to perform alchemy or transmutations, which is like this magical ability. He sacrificed the ability itself for the sake of his brother, which is what they were trying to achieve and get his brother's body back because of how taboo or, um, or horrifying human transmutation is because what can you give up in exchange for a human life? They are invaluable. They have unlimited value. It's not the same. There's nothing you could sacrifice that would be worth that except unless like it was his like ability to perform the magical ability to begin with. Okay, sure. Fair enough. But the bottom line is it, it's funny. It's so funny. Like the letters that I received uh, from people after putting out the philosopher lecture and, and I even had a few INFPs message me at an ESTJ message me, but in general, it was like, I know so many philosophers in my family who have sacrificed me for their own personal game. And I also have sacrificed them for their own personal game. I've even seen my own daughter do that to uh, her brother. Uh, she's an ENFP, but she's not since done that. Now I see her being much more charitable and realizing that, you know, through her own efforts, through her own, uh, yeah, through her own effort, she can earn her own way. She could, she, she sacrifices herself, sacrifices her time. For example, uh, for the first time ever, and this is my five-year-old, she read, she read a book by herself to me. She read her book to her daddy. And this was a fantastic experience. Why is this necessary? Because I, uh, she pulled out the first, like, we had like this little box of like 12 books in it, and they go up in difficulty. And they're like, they're, they're training books for children for, for reading. And she pulls out the first three books and she could read them just fine. And she was, she was reading them to me and that was great. I, not knowing how that box worked because I have like SE Demon and I had no SI data for it at all. I pulled out the one on the end, which is book 12, which is the most difficult uh, book to read. And I gave it to her and she read that book to me all the way through. And I was, I, and when I found out it was uh, what it really, the nature of that book, I was really astonished. She really uh, has gone out of her way to earn. Why? Well, very easily because she come to realize that she didn't have to sacrifice other people and get other people to do her homework for her. She could do it herself. Okay. Because previously she was trying to get other people, other classmates, uh, uh, her mother or teacher to help her with her homework instead of realizing that she could do it herself. And then as soon as she did, her grades went up. I, I actually, we got um, uh, like probably the most perfect report card I've ever seen, uh, you know, uh, uh, from her teacher, uh, for, for my little girl. And I, and I went up to my ENFP daughter and I told her, you know, I am so proud of you. I've never seen a, a report card this good before. You are very, very good at academics and at school. This is excellent. You do such a great job. You're so much further ahead. I'm sure of other students. It even said in her report card that she should be moved up to other grades, that her teacher was recommending moving her up into more advanced grades than the grade that she's currently in. That was pretty surprising. 
And I told her, you know, how proud of her I was. And I told her that that's excellent that, you know, you have this academic capability. And, you know, and, and it's nice to see that you are putting the time and the effort on your own to earn your own way. And then she's not sacrificing her brother or her mother, or her teacher, or any of her classmates. And that kind of encouragement that I offered to my philosopher daughter, as a result of having that encouragement, she's gone out of her way to even further more excel. And that, then the final most recent fruit of that, that came as a result of that situation, she read that advanced book to me on our last visit a few days ago. And that was amazing. It's nice to see how far that goes. Now, you know, my son, he's, he's awesome. He's not the best at academics, but he's great at other things. Right now he's studying music. And I believe that because he loves music and he's always telling me about how he wants to become a pianist or, or wants to become a musician, he will do that. We've made arrangements for, uh, for him to get uh, in front of a, a teacher and to get additional schooling for it. Uh, we got him a, a ukulele, a training ukulele to, uh, to start on that. And I remember the first day we gave him a, um, gosh, a, a, a harmonica and wow, he knew how to play it just, just right out of the box. And he was only, he was only uh, like four or five years old. He just ran with it. He, he already like intuitively knew how it worked. I'm like, wow, you got some skills there. You know, that's the thing folks, when you're, when you're in your life, find that one thing that you're good at and just hammer it. I don't care about school. I don't care about college. I don't care about your job. I don't care about any of that. Find the one thing you're good at and hammer it and devote yourself to that. It's not about how good you do in school. It's a, or it could be about how good you are in school. If school is where you excel, then fine, be an academic. That's great, kudos to you. If you're great at music, great, kudos to you. It doesn't matter. Find the one thing that you're good at and hammer it. And I'm quoting like literally uh, Owen Cook, AKA RSD Tyler from RSD Motivation when I say that, right? Look up his, uh, his uh, video on YouTube called Truth About Life, RSD Tyler. It'll really uh, kick you in the pants if you know what I mean. But the bottom line is, folks, philosophers need to get to a point that, you know, like it's, you know, you can't sacrifice your fellow human beings for your own success. You guys have to realize that you have the capacity to be absolutely fundamentally selfish, where you're looking at your own comfort and your own feelings and your own values without any consideration of other people's comfort or their values, and then creating arbitrary rules that actually can end up destroying culture and destroying other people's well-being and, under, and destroying their lives when you're doing it in the name of creating a utopia. That's literally no different than Joseph Stalin murdering people for stealing apples or food, you know, uh, in, in communist Russia. That's no different when you're allowing the rules, right? The, the rules to dictate human behavior. That's where you get people who are like, ooh, I was just following orders, right? And that is the kind of culture that philosophers can end up creating. That's a problem. Okay. And it's all about human sacrifice versus self-sacrifice. Philosophers, are you going to stop being lazy, take responsibility for your own actions and focus on sacrificing yourself, your time, your effort, and putting in the effort to earn your own way? If you just spend time reading, which will make you brilliant. I don't know how many times I even hear TI tricksters like ENFPs making it into Mensa, but apparently Mensa is giving out a membership to just anyone these days that can pass their test. Oh wait, that's right. TE child or wait, TE users in general can pass any test because assessments is where TE is able to just handle it. It's pretty simple, right? That's just how it works because guess what? Tests or assessments are TE systems themselves right? And you already have an advantage. So why do you worry so much about your perception that you give off to other people? Oh, I want people to believe I'm smart. You can actually be smart if you spend the time reading and get off your lazy ass and actually do it. Then you wouldn't have to sacrifice your fellow human beings for your own success and actually build your own success because you have a high level of understanding to do it. And then because you have crafted your own philosopher's stone to gain your own success, right? This is the virtue and vice of the philosopher. Self-sacrifice versus human sacrifice. Do not do the expedient thing. Do the meaningful thing. Work hard. Stop trying to be the rabbit and stop feeling bad that you're not the rabbit and instead be the tortoise. Work hard. You can say the same thing to crusaders. 
crusaders and philosophers be the tortoise you will learn everything you need to do you will be successful as long as you don't give up be the tortoise in the race just keep going and don't give up faith you will make it through templars and wayfarers do what you want use your freedom but don't use your freedom in a way to destroy the freedoms of others be careful be careful So anyway, folks, um, just to kind of finish up here, uh, the virtue and vice crusader, once again, is injustice versus justice. Um, and then for Templars, it's unrighteousness versus righteousness or hypocrisy versus righteousness. Wayfarer, it's uh, stealing versus earning. Uh, and uh, for the philosopher, it's human sacrifice versus self-sacrifice. And hopefully uh, this nice little wrap up episode gives you everything that you need to like come to a full understanding of all of the strengths and the weaknesses of the, of the four quadras. So you can utilize that to identify yourself, um, you know, um, which, you know, is, is really important. I mean, think about it. Like, how could you identify yourself? The type grid. So when you're using the type grid, you know what types, like, especially when you're looking at, um, when you're looking at this whiteboard, you know what types are the individual quadras right here. So circle them out on a type grid, which quadra is which. And if you know you are one of these quadras based on these definitions shared in this lecture, you've already just eliminated 12 of the types according to the type grid. You've already eliminated it. So this, the quadras themselves are definitely another way that you could utilize the type grid to figure out what type you are. That way now, you can utilize uh, communication styles or interaction styles as well as disposition or temperament and quadras combined to figure out what type you are specifically. It's not that hard, right? That's how it works. It's another way that you can interface with the type grid. That is the number one reason other than exposing the human condition and exposing all of our flaws to each other and showing how we come off to each other, strengths and weaknesses wise. It's the other main reason why I'm even doing this you can actually come to a fundamental understanding of yourself and others by applying what you've learned here about the quadras directly to the type grid. That's how it works, folks. So I might do like a small 10 minute uh, episode explaining that uh, in the near future uh, for season 17, uh, probably. Uh, but yeah, I just want you folks to uh, know that. So Anyway, if you found this lecture useful, helpful, educational, stay tuned because we're doing a Q&A. And uh, also, uh, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and then leave a like uh, below and comment if you have any questions about quadras, uh, any remaining questions, et cetera. Uh, then we'll definitely do that. Um, okay, so we have a Q&A time. So I'm going to give everybody the ability to talk um, so they can ask their questions. Um, so let's uh, be uh, gentle in there. So this is John Bodine. So uh, John Bodine asks, every type is two halves of a quadra. Can you talk about how they interact with each other, the same person, i.e. Uh, how having half -way wayfarer interacts with half crusader? And does this mean on a larger level in regards to interactions with others and personal responsibility, i.e. having the weight of both quadras resting on your shoulders? Absolutely. This is why, like, when you're taking, uh, this is why when you're taking our personality assessment, because it's about to release, we'll be releasing it to patrons first. Uh, but when it releases, uh, you'll kind of realize is that we're trying to get you to focus on traits that you are primarily. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to succumb to the strengths and weaknesses of all the quadras represented within the own four sides of the mind. You have to recognize that you bear all of the responsibilities based on doing the meaningful versus the expedient for each of the quadras. Uh, for each, you know, within, within the four sides of your mind. You absolutely have to. How else are you going to reach cognitive integration? How else are you going to reach enlightenment as a human being if you do not do that? So you absolutely do bear the responsibility. You have to bear that responsibility. Um, so where did I get my shirt? Uh, I got it at the mall and uh, my wife Railgun got it for me. Thank you. She's decided that uh, I need to have a better wardrobe uh, recently and has purchased uh, some shirts. I had another shirt in season 22, episode seven that I just filmed. Sorry about the sound being a little weak on that one, by the way, but it's a white shirt with black sharks. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and we came up with my rapper name as a result, oh, which I shared in that uh, lecture. 
CT Stewart one. Uh, John Bodine, did I answer your question? Um, I hope I did. Uh, what does this mean at a large level interaction with others and personal responsibility? Ultimately, you may not be aware of how you're coming off to others, John, and then as a result of that, uh, you can find yourself um, in that, uh, uh, you know, in that situation where it's like, oh crap, that's a part of myself that I need to work on a little bit more. I, I actually talk a little bit about this uh, in a recent Ruby conference, as well as uh, season 22, episode seven, which is calling the transitions of ENTPs. I talk about how sometimes you have to pipe uh, certain functions or at least certain size of the mind through other functions through which is basically developing neural pathways uh, in your brain um, like for example if a superego is interest-based but the rest of the mind is all systematic you can actually pipe the interest base through um, that particular type's inferior function through introverted sensing self-discipline to develop a habit of doing an interest check even though you're not just default interest aware and as a result, that's also very necessary, et cetera. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, go ahead and ask it again if need, if necessary. Uh, CT Stewart one asks, when David did, when David Data says give your deepest gift, does that basically mean live in your virtue? Is it more than that? It is. It is more than that. It's not just your virtue because. Uh, every human being is responsible for all of the virtues and all the vices, be it quadra or individual types or even temperament or interaction style, uh, uh, cognitive axes, it doesn't matter. Every aspect of a person's persona, each human being, or of available persona, each human being is ultimately responsible uh, for that. Because at any moment, you could take on that role. Uh, just like Dr. John Beebe says, you know, when a person takes on a title or a role, like the role of father, even though they are not a father, but they can assume the role of father, it comes with all the benefits and the responsibilities of that role. And as soon as you stop behaving like that role, you lose all those benefits and those responsibilities for that role. And he cited this one movie of a lesbian couple where one of the women in the couple had to become the father to protect their children uh, against a, a man and she called this man the interloper etc in fact the name of the scene is called interloper i forgot what the name of the movie was but that was in his recent presentation that i watched uh, uh, in uh, northern california which was it was great to be a part of that so your deepest gift is is something far more than just your virtue or your vice and even then your vices can actually be necessary. Your vices are not always a bad thing. Your vices can be good things because those vices can be a way for you to potentially defend yourself or protect yourself uh, from abuse from other people. So sometimes vices can be good. Not often, not as often as virtues can be good. But then also virtues themselves can also become an obstacle. It's important to focus yourself towards a state of integration, towards a state of balance and not necessarily be hard focused on one thing here or one thing there. Think about it this way. If the four sides of the mind is a farm, right? You have, uh, you have one field in your ego, another field is your subconscious, another field is your shadow, and another field is your superego, and you have a, a, a preset amount of water, and all of your water is on your main field because you know it's, it's, it's going to yield what it yields, and then you're practicing a little bit to get uh, you know, your subconscious field, and, you're allowing some of your water to flow through the irrigation gateway of your inferior function into your subconscious. If you're allowing that to happen, you could potentially be in your subconscious and your ego simultaneously if the water levels are about the same. Or you could be hyper focused on the subconscious, etc. Or you could, you know, do you see what I'm saying? You could potentially be in all four sides of your mind simultaneously uh, as people become uh, more capable with mastering their gateways over time. But, and using their gateways as a result. But that does not necessarily mean we need to always be focused on one thing. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It's very circumstantial. It's important to develop yourself at every single aspect of human existence and human growth and maintain a state of continuous improvement, maintain a state of Kaizen because Kaizen itself is the essence of enlightenment. It really actually is. Continuous improvement is the essence of integration and enlightenment, the essence of balance, the essence of the Tao, essentially. That's where it comes from. So 
Uh, Helen Shang asks, uh, Wayfair is steal people by being wanty and needy. Yes, they can, especially in cheating situations with, uh, with like relationships. And they earn people by being trusting. Absolutely. Why is it, do you think INTJs need to be with ENTPs as a golden pair? It's because ENTPs number one need is trust. That's their number one need is trust. And INTJs are hard pressed to give trust. Think about that for a second. Think about it. Uh, John Bodine uh, asks again, uh, you did answer my question, thanks. Uh, two more for you. Can SE users be the tortoise or is there a path different? Uh, SE users can be a tortoise uh, and honestly, I recommend everyone be the tortoise, but uh, oftentimes SE users are so focused on performance that they often end up living their life based on talent and talent is the way of the rabbit and not the way of the tortoise. Uh, through developing the other sides of their mind, they can start to understand uh, the, the, the lessons and the secrets of the tortoise and gain those benefits. And as much as an SI user needs to develop their talent over time, can actually end up becoming a rabbit later in life. It's a balance. It's, it's, a, it's a yin and yang equilibrium. I hope that answers your question, John. Second question from Mr. John uh, Bodine. Uh, if a crusader type uh, gets with the Templar or Wayfair, is there something special about having access to all four quadras within the relationship like you and your wife? Yes, there is. It provides a completely uh, different perspective. And as a result, I was able to actually further develop my superego and uh, reach some benefits of my superego's cognition that I did not have before, basically as a result of her influence and tutelage and improving me. It's nice that Templars exist to improve fellow human beings. And then as a result of improving those fellow human beings, she based and having that capability, well, she used that capability on me and then I became better for it. And this is why I always, and I developed the habit of always asking this question whenever I meet somebody, what is this person getting out of the situation? And are they getting more out of it than I am? And if they are getting more out of it than I am, then they're automatically manipulating me and then I need to treat them as a manipulator. That's a habit that I developed as a result of her direct influence. And I would not have come to that conclusion because me being interest-based is part of my superego. But I had to develop the SI habit and pipe the, uh, the, the superego interest directly in to my uh, introverted sensing uh, uh, inferior function uh, it, as part of its uh, goal or uh, journey to being aspirational and develop the habit or the self-discipline of doing that every time I have an interaction with a fellow human being. And as a result, I'm more protected. It's also why my block list, it has 850 plus people in it now, uh, whereas it did not before. I block people all the time, constantly. It's funny how those wayfarers, and this usually happens with wayfarers more than anyone else, people ask me questions about stuff pertaining to psychology and type, and they're just trying to get freebies from me instead of actually willing to pay for coaching or become a patron or whatever, because it's all about my freebies, right? Always trying to steal from me and it's really frustrating. So I just block them. Sometimes I take their copies of their chat logs and I publicly shame them on Facebook and expose them to everybody else because of how you know pathetic they can be when they're in their, their uh, stealing wafer vice, which is really frustrating to me. So, okay. Uh, another question, uh, CT Stewart one asks, if Templars are attracted to the high morals of philosophers, what makes philosophers uh, attracted to Templars? I think that is uh, the Templars' capability. They're also the Templars' ability to help them uh, and to make them more comfortable. Philosophers like being helped. They like to have their burdens lifted off their shoulders. They don't like to have to necessarily do everything alone. And it's kind of interesting because if you consider philosophers, none of them are actually pragmatic. They're all affiliative and they're all interdependent because of that. And they like to have their burdens and their loads shared with others and Templars being FE users and SE users combined are all about removing burdens on other people instead of putting burdens on them. And as a result, philosophers end up gaining those benefits. CT Stewart says, being triple interest-based and having TE Trickster and uh, SI Demon, would INFJs uh, do best going in a self-taught route. Absolutely. I maintain INFJs should be all about being autodidacts. Jesus of the INFJs is an autodidact. He never had any official schooling as a rabbi, right? There's so many INFJ computer programmers out there and that type is probably the best computer programmer of all the types. They just pick up books, they read it, they know it, they do it. 
move on to the next thing. They don't have to have former schooling. It's just that affiliative interdependent uh, thing that gets in the way of INFJs where they end up believing the wrong beliefs, their TE tricks that they have to go to school, get a job, uh, go, to, go, to, go to school, go to college, get a job, have a life that way because that's the right thing to do, right? Well, no, it's not the right thing to do. INFJs need to get to a point where they are autodidacts. Even my INFJ mentor himself is an autodidact and a damn good one. And it's because he spends time reading and practicing every single day. So, uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Um, I think I got all of them. Anyone else? Now's the chance. Uh, you can put it in the question and answer button, or you can po uh, put it in the chat. Um, not sure if anyone can like raise their hand. That would be kind of interesting, because uh, then like I'd probably be able to see a little bit better. Anyone else? Oh, here we go. Uh, it's okay. Be long-winded, Mr. Aaron. That's fine. So while uh, Aaron is uh, putting out that one, anyone else have any other questions involving uh, virtue advice to the Quadros? Perhaps using uh, the type grid uh, to, you know, using the Quadros to get a better result to verify your type on the type grid. It's like, that's just one thing like people don't even think about doing is verifying their own, uh, their own type. I'll put it. Okay, so Aaron asks, uh, regarding your answer relating to a fair deal or an equivalent exchange and the way you handle the situation, if you get the idea that they are being uh, manipulative, okay, sure. I mean, sometimes situations are mutually beneficial, sometimes they're not. How do you handle that same situation if it's actually you that is initiating the exchange? The thing is, is that I recognize that my own introverted thinking uh, can be ignorant because I am at risk of being in an echo chamber mentally because it's logic. Logic can exist within an echo chamber and that's a problem. Whereas TE rationale cannot really, well, it can be an echo chamber, but uh, it's supposed to be questioning of everyone's thinking by default. So it's not usually in an echo chamber. And then also how run the risk of, um, of being in last known input. And I kind of feel bad because I didn't uh, look into the ignorance of TE as much, but basically the ignorance of TE is just ignorance uh, in terms of uh, going with the crowd and what the crowd thinks instead of verifying. It's lack of verification is the ignorance of TE. Um, but uh, I think it was really important to state it, at least for the TI users. I kind of regret not saying that for the philosophers and the wayfarers in this lecture. Um, but uh, even if I am initiating, I still have that habit anyway, because I could have been set up uh, in such a way where I would initiate with other people and I wouldn't have known it. Like there could have been external stimuli or things going on behind the scenes that were in the background that I wasn't even aware of that could have prompted me to initiate. I would still have to exercise that habit regardless, because sometimes people's manipulations can become so elaborate that you're not necessarily sure about uh, whether or not, uh, you know, whether or not uh, your, initi your initiation itself was designed. <laughs> and it would be arrogant to believe that it never would be. Um, and uh, hopefully that answers your question. Lev asks, so to be clear, each personality type has their own primary and secondary and tertiaries and so on and so forth. Uh, virtue and vice like from ISTP, uh, primary virtue and vice and ESTPs are secondary. Uh, each quadra has their own virtue and vice. You have four sides of the mind and two sides of the same quadra. Does that mean we have 10 virtue and vices? It means you have every virtue and vice potentially. Yes, basically, yes. It's just, I mean, it's the same. It's just like where you are in your cognitive development, how, uh, how, uh, um, how balanced are you as an individual? Uh, and refer to the content in season 19 because as long as you're, uh, you know, going through the path to cognitive integration and becoming a better person, the best version of you, as it's said in season 19, you, uh, you would be able to utilize the virtues and vices as necessary or as needed throughout your life and also to other people's benefit, not just your own. So, 
All right, looks like some more questions come in. Is Simon Sinek subconscious or unconscious focused? Uh, I would say he's probably unconscious focused, um, but I'm not entirely sure about that. And uh, CT Stewart one asks, uh, last question, where's ISTPs like to learn for the sake of learning? Do INTJs or do INFJs learn skills to be extremely useful to one person? Yes, that's why they learn skills. It's all about being useful uh, because they feel like they're worthless. They wanna be the most useful person in the tool shed. So they wanna compensate for that feeling of worthlessness. So they learn skills uh, specifically to be extremely useful. Yes, that is correct. Um, although I'm not sure how that question had anything to do with the quadras, but fair enough. Um, guys, there is a Q&A session. I believe it's on Tuesday of next week. And since you guys are all patrons, uh, bring your questions there and put it in the Patreon Q&A channel. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll get that question in. So... And uh, Aaron asks, in the same respect, when you do something uh, without expecting anything in return, although all forms of communication are manipulation as stated, if the person on the other side of the exchange viewed it in the same manner you do, couldn't you see that as an issue? No, not at all, because you have to look at the text, at the context of the connotation of the manipulation itself. And when I say manipulation, and by meaning manipulation in terms of all social interaction is manipulation, manipulation in the context of, of neutrality, or am I saying manipulation in terms of the negative connotation? Obviously, I meant the negative connotation. It's just not my fault that the term uh, manipulation, or at least the English language is so limited with its terms. Perhaps I could admit that I need to have better precision of language, but we're just typically speaking in colloquialisms for the, benefit, for the benefit of lay members of this audience. Hence why I'm throwing around terminology that's very similar, but the context, because I'm an informative speaker, I'm not a direct speaker, changes almost with every sentence that comes out of my mouth, potentially. So uh, please consider it in that vein. I hope that made sense. Um, so, but good question regardless. Uh, anyone else? Uh, anyone else? Uh, any, anyone else? Because uh, I need to leave. Um, it's uh, about time. Thanks. There's more to it than that, but thanks, dude. I'm sorry, Aaron. I'm trying. I'm trying to do my best here, like uh, because I think you're just getting hung up on manipulation as the term. Because I don't think your question could have existed without that first. And since that seemed to be your root premise, I went after the root premise, and that's why I responded the way that I did. So uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, all of this, uh, all of this will be going public. All the Q and A component of it will, anyway. So, anyway, folks, uh, that's it for tonight. And uh, thank you all for coming uh, to the live lecture. Don't forget, we have Patreon Q and A next week. Get your questions into the Q and A channel on Discord. Uh, and if you're not on Discord, go to csjoseph.life forward slash social to be able to get onto Discord. If you're not there already, for those of you that are new, so. With that being said, folks, uh, thank you all. Have a good night, and I'll see you guys next time.